to our weekly live Q&A for our Meals That Change the World series with Dr. Laura Carlson uh, over the next, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, over the next, <laughs> over the next 20 minutes or so, Laura Carlson and I will be jumping uh, through the great questions that you sent us this week uh, in response to lecture three, excuse me, lecture two. Um, uh, a reminder that we are making a video recording of this lecture. So if you encounter any technical difficulties or um, you have any friends uh, who are not able to enjoy uh, today's live Q&A, uh, we'll be sending the video recording of it to you in our weekly email on Monday and you'll be able to enjoy it uh, at a later date. But in the meantime, uh, it is as always my great pleasure and privilege to welcome our fearless culinary leader, Dr. Laura Carlson. Uh, welcome to you, Laura. Thank you, thank you. Always great to be here. All right, so I'm gonna dive right in. We received a, a, a wealth and abundance, a cornucopia of great <laughs> questions this re, uh, week in response to your fascinating survey of the, uh, the, the great meals of, of Roman Pompeii. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna jump right into it with a question from Roseanne who asks, did women have meals or social gatherings for themselves similar to the dinner, the great feast uh, that you described uh, at the center of lecture two? This is a great question. Um, and it has a couple of different parts in terms of answering it because in terms of women attending dinner parties outside the home, prior to the second century BCE, we don't have that much in terms of evidence of women doing a lot of, say, entertaining, um, at least outside the home, attending dinner parties outside their own home. Actually, it was kind of a social more, if you will, that a woman who did attend a dinner party with anyone outside of her family um, or outside of the home was seen to be, well, face a little bit of so social uh, uh, castigation, if you will. Um, now that does change, as I mentioned, in the second century. Women do start attending outside the home dinner parties and even outside the home dinner parties with men, although some conservative eyebrows may have been raised about this. Um, one famous example of a woman who apparently loved to dine um, out and anywhere in Rome uh, was Sempronia, who was um, the wife of Brutus. If you know your Roman history, you'll know that was the consul who was responsible or partially responsible for the assassination of Julius Caesar. Um, and so apparently she was a frequent uh, attendant at dinner parties, loved to, loved to dance apparently. But yes, she was also the object of quite considerable Roman elite gossip at the time for the fact that she did love to go out entertaining. Um, now, unfortunately, even though we do see this period, say, between the second century and, say, maybe the first to second century CE or AD, where women are doing a lot more entertaining and attending parties outside the home, when you actually get to the later Roman period, let's say, third, fourth, fifth century, that unfortunately starts to wane a little bit more, that women were, again, feeling a lot of social pressure, that it wasn't acceptable to dine outside the home or to be seen to dine with men that were not say their blood relatives or their husbands or something like that. And, and we attribute that largely to the growing influence of Christianity actually as part of the Roman empire, it becomes the official religion. And that seems to go hand in hand with women being kind of restricted a little bit more in terms of their social engagements. Now, when you ask specifically about meals and social gatherings for women, I can't say necessarily I can point to a specific dinner party, but we do have evidence of annual feasts that were specifically dedicated to married women um, and mothers in particular, um, and kind of these feasts that were celebrating motherhood and childbirth. And that often featured dinners or let's say gatherings that were very women focused. Um, so there was an annual feast that was usually celebrated on March 1st known as Matronalia. Um, and it comes, you can see maybe the word matron in there. Uh, it was the ancient festival of Juno, who is the goddess of childbirth. So this was annually celebrated by Roman matrons AKA married women. Um, and they would all kind of truck to the temple of Juno. They would make offerings there. And oftentimes this was 
also a time for all these women to be gathering in the temple, perhaps, you know, sharing food, sharing kind of this celebratory feast-like atmosphere. Um, and so on this day as well, matrons would often also at their home hold a banquet for their female servants. Um, so it was seen to be kind of an all levels celebration of, of women and particularly in this case, married women. So, you know, that's a bit of a scattered answer, but we can see at least some examples in Roman history of women either dining outside the home and what the perspective was on that, but also festivals that involved a lot of eating and, and feasting, if you will, uh, around kind of women in general. Mm -hmm. So Laura, just to put all this in a little more context, I mean, so much of this fascinating information we now know about the eating culture in Pompeii derives directly from these remarkable archaeological sites that have been preserved in Pompeii. Can you give us a little sense? We've got, I've got a follow-up question here asking about how Pompeii is being preserved today, especially as it relates to the effects of tourism, weather, and pollution. And that is a great question. And it's something that Pompeii historians, archaeologists have wrestled with, and you could say they wrestle with, with any archaeological excavation, but in particular because Pompeii is such a world famous, celebrated, and unique archaeological excavation, and one you might say is an ongoing archaeological excavation. As I mentioned, I think in the lecture, that a lot of Pompeii actually hasn't been uncovered yet, that a lot of it still remains under those layers and layers of ash. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, the process of archaeology is by nature a destructive one that in digging down, in uncovering these great artifacts, in learning all this information that we are about Pompeii, you are necessarily also destroying things as well. Um, and even as careful as archaeology archaeologists are, they are aware that once they excavate something, you know, there's no going back. There's no kind of putting the lid back on the box and any decisions they make will have repercussions for any other excavation that is to come. So with that in mind, there is a moratorium on a lot of excavations going on in Pompeii right now because of this worry about what is happening to Pompeii, um, that by exposing these 2000 year old mosaics and um, homes and you know pots and all these other things to the elements, you are essentially exposing them to weather and all these other things, uh, say tourism. And that's a really good point that tourism in Pompeii in some ways can help save Pompeii, that you have all these people coming in, learning about it, celebrating it, um, donating to its preservation effects. but the more people you get in, the more kind of foot traffic you get in, the more wear and tear you have on these objects um, and these roads even, uh, there is a concern that that will also have a detrimental effect on it. So there's always a push and pull with Pompeii. Um, as I said, there have been moratoriums placed on new archeological excavations. Um, so they've been trying to just hold off on exposing anything else and saying, well, let's take what we have, let's learn from it. We have so much already in Pompeii before we go ahead and uncover something else, which again, it does involve a process of destruction. Um, so that is at least perhaps the, the biggest element in terms of preservation. I mean, even if they're not doing ongoing extensive excavations, Pompeii and the, the park, shall we say, um, and kind of the historical organization that helps manage the excavation or manage the site, if you will, um, they are always looking at additional conservation efforts of trying to make sure while keeping the historic integrity of the site in place, making sure everything that has been uncovered remains as safe as possible um, and remains safe and preserved for future generations. So in some cases that's removing items from the site and taking them to museums, um, making sure that they're you know, placed under the right environmental conditions. And in others, it's just say, if too much traffic has gone to one of the homes and they see a little bit of wear and tear on the homes, they'll kind of um, say prevent tourists from visiting that just to give it a little bit of breathing space um, and try and support say a structure so that it won't it, it will last for new generations, but that's a great question. Right, right. So now shifting our focus to what's actually on the menu in ancient Pompeii, 
Uh, Lori DeMarco writes in uh, that she recalls an image in one of uh, the photos you shared in your lecture of fish. She's wondering if there were different species of fish uh, that would have been uh, consumed during uh, that time period that are not around today. This, I love the specificity of this question. Um, and because the Romans are, were such detailed record keepers, um, you know, from soup to nuts in terms of what they were eating, how they prepared it, how much it was sold for when fish was caught, we can actually learn quite a bit about the fish market or the seafood market of ancient Rome. Um, and we do have to remember that Rome, we, we just kind of say Rome very generally, but we are talking about well, a monarchy, a republic, an empire over very different periods. I mean, really hundreds of years. So just as things change in terms of value, things change in terms of what's trendy to eat, what people want to eat, it is exactly the same way in ancient Rome. So in terms of fish, I'm not sure we can specifically identify any fish that were around in the Mediterranean and we are, were being consumed by the Romans that have gone extinct or that are not around today. But certainly there were a lot of different species of fish that the Romans really prized that may not be as prized today in a lot of menus. But a lot of the types of fish or the species of fish we would certainly recognize. Um, so things like mullet, bass, bream, anchovies, all of these were favorites of the Roman culinary world. Um, there was generally a rule of thumb that the bigger the fish, and this certainly goes today, um, the bigger the fish, the more valuable the fish. So things like bass and tuna and things like that, higher commercial value. Um, along those lines, very similar to today, um, marine fish, fish that was um, taken out of the Mediterranean, usually a little bit more expensive than freshwater fish. That just was kind of a general, uh, yeah, a general theme that seems to endure across the entirety of, of the Roman world. Um, now we do see some interesting things that go in and out of trends. Um, for example, mollusks, used to be quite a, a rarity, a very expensive thing to provide uh, to your guests on your dinner table. And so there was actually even a legislation in, I think it's like 100 or so BCE, where the emperor issues an edict that you actually can't serve mollusks on your dinner table because they were seen as this just extravagant luxury kind of waste that people were just putting tons and tons of mollusks on their dinner tables and they were just wasting them all and they weren't eating them all. Um, but if you go just a couple hundred centuries later, mollusks now have no social value at all. And they were kind of seen as, you know, something that you ate if you couldn't afford a better version of seafood. So again, all these trends are changing, um, you know, as you move to different time periods in the Roman world. And one thing I just wanted to touch about with fish, and it was a shame that I didn't have a chance to touch on it in the lecture, is of course, really one of the main ways that the Romans are uh, say, eating or enjoying fish on their dinner tables, it's of course through garum, that preserved fish sauce that, you know, the catch-all term is um, that garum was the ketchup of the Roman world, that this was the sauce that you found on any and every table. They put it on almost literally everything they ate. And if you think a bit like, almost like olive oil today, that there are actually different ranges and qualities of garum that you could have very very expensive, very kind of whole food style garum, all the way down to your kind of bargain basics uh, garum that, you know, cost you only a, a, a few coins or whatnot. But that actually was a huge trade throughout all of the Mediterranean. Um, so a lot of fish were actually, particularly things like anchovies, were kind of um, rerouted instead of showing up just on your dinner plate, you would be enjoying uh, anchovies as the fish sauce of garum. Okay, well, Great question from Lori. And I got to just quickly mention before we move on to our next question, Lori did mention in her email that she is making the tiger nut cakes from, <laughs> uh, from, from uh, lecture one from ancient Egypt. It. So, so Lori, please write in and let us know how they turned out. I'd love um, to know. <laughs> uh, moving on to a great question uh, from Rochelle Thompson. Since, Vesuv since Vesuvius is thought to have erupted at midday, can you expand on the social habits around luncheon and what the residents of Pompeii may have been doing then. For example, was the family eating together or did some people take their lunch to work? 
where their communal eating places outside of the home were they at market? Absolutely. And this is a great question because obviously it ties into, as you say, what were people doing when this eruption really took hold? That, you know, people had been seeing that Vesuvius was up to something perhaps in the early morning, but it, I don't think, or at least the records don't reflect, that anyone really realized something serious was happening until around noon. And of course, as you rightly point out, noon was lunchtime. Um, most Romans would have taken their midday and probably their largest meal around this time. Um, and people actually record how they take lunch exactly at the noon bell. Um, so this, as I said, a, a large meal, but often not necessarily a very elaborate meal. Um, very clearly, as we talked about in the lecture, bread would have been a significant component of your lunch and usually would have formed the base of anything that you were having on top of it. So Romans love to have things like, you know, dates and olives, or maybe if you had a sweet tooth, you'd add a little bit of honey on top of your, um, your bread that you were having. Um, but you could also go for a little bit more of a luxurious or more prepared meal, say like boiled beans or eggs or something like that, that could have gone on top of your bread. I mean, if you kind of start to put these things together, it starts looking more and more like your basic kind of grab and go sandwich um, that you know many of us would have had as, a, as an easy lunch if we were not working from home. And you ask a great question about where they would have been eating this. I mean, certainly if you were working in the home, um, you would have had lunch likely in the home, um, but it was much more likely that you would have gone out um, and gone to one of the thermopolia, which were the essentially fast food restaurants of Pompeii and the Roman world. And there were dozens of these available in Pompeii. And most of the time when you would go, um, they would have, of course, bread for you, to ha for you to have and form kind of the base of your sandwich. You would also have perhaps an option to get a glass of wine um, to go with your lunch and meal. Um, but then they would have these very large urns placed and almost built into the countertop or bar of the thermopolia. And they would have filled exactly with what I was saying, you know, olives, dates, cheese, perhaps, you know, a, a, a bean dish of some kind. And so that you would, or the um, kind of thermopolia uh, host, if you will, um, would kind of ask what you would like out of the urns that had been prepared for that day and kind of assemble your little grab and go sandwich. And you could either take it with you to wherever it is you wanted to eat, um, take it perhaps to you know the marketplace and grab a seat or something like that. Or these thermopolia often had their own dining rooms built in and these were both indoor and outdoor dining rooms. Um, so you could either kind of sit in the equivalent of a cafe and kind of just eat your bread there, or you could go out to the nice patio dining room um, mm -hmm. of the Thermopolia. Um, so this is likely kind of where most people would have been. Um, certainly many in the home. I don't think a lot of Romans would have needed or felt the necessity to return home to have lunch. They would just hang out the local Thermopolia, or you would actually go out to eat at the Thermopolia um, at midday to get, you know, your favorite uh, kind of dates and olives sandwich um, from your, your local grab and go. Mm -hmm. You paint a lovely picture there of eating <laughs> al fresco under the, the, uh, the sun of Southern Italy and until suddenly the, the storm clouds rise <laughs> on the horizon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually on that, on that note, uh, Laura, I was, we, I was mentioning to you in an email we were exchanging the other day. Um, I read a recent, article in the New Yorker that was quite interesting, talking about uh, Pliny the Elder, who was the great, he was, I believe, the head of the Roman Navy and also a great naturalist who left many wonderful records of the flora and fauna of the Roman Empire behind. Um, and apparently he, when rushing to the, to the coast uh, to deal with this impending national emergency, he made sure to pause to have a full dinner and a nap while Vesuvius was erupted. And it's widely thought now that that may have been the reason he ultimately was not able to escape and perished on the beach. So just a sense of how the Roman eating habits would have played out within the timeline on this incredibly dramatic day in world history. Absolutely. Um, so, Laura, we're, we're running out of time now, um, but I guess it might be good just to close 
by sort of returning to one of the themes you were gesturing at in, in the very beginning, which is the idea of how Roman eating habits changed over time. Um, Michelle uh, Theore wrote in with a, a very interesting question asking about, you know, how, why did Roman eating habits change over the course of the empire? Shed a little light on that for us. I mean, this is a wonderful question and could be the basis of an entire, you know, university course unto itself. Because again, we are talking about hundreds of years um, in terms of the history of Rome. I mean, we can take it all the way up if we want to talk about the long history of Rome up to 1453, if we're looking at, you know, Constantinople and Istanbul and all those things. Um, so, you know, if you even look back within the last 50 to 75 years, or even the last 10 to 20 years in our own food culture, and we think about food trends and how quickly they change. I mean, think about, you know, the rise of the, the no carb diet, right? A bread is in and then bread is out or eggs are good, eggs are bad. I mean, these eating trends oftentimes sponsored by changing understandings of, um, you know, nutrition, dietary science, that, that kind of thing, but also just trends from a cultural and social perspective that all of a sudden, you know, uh, one dish or one style of cooking becomes super, super popular just because it seems like people, people turn to it and discover it and, and enjoy it. And then two years later, another food trend pops up. So, on a very long, long scale, we can certainly perhaps see similarities of why eating trends change between the Republic and Imperial Rome. Um, but I mean, as a very broad sketch, and this, this does mirror what I was mentioning in the lecture, is that we do see some philosophical trends change from the Republic to Imperial Rome. Um, a philosophy, of course, was a, a huge discipline in Rome and obviously, you know, taking from ancient Greece and things like that. But the philosophers um, who were writers and speakers who were um, kind of talking to the Roman people at this point in time and saying, what did it involve to live a good or moral or virtuous life? You know, we do see a shift in what the writers from the Republic era are writing to those writing during the imperial period. And Perhaps those are the, the things that we can draw on to note what, what is changing in terms of food and what they're eating. So during the Republic, it was all about moderation, keeping things simple, you know, appreciating constituent components for themselves. So, you know, this would be along the lines, I don't want to, you know, draw too many comparisons because, you know, the, the more you get dig into them, the less they actually work. But I think it is helpful to, to think of them in these ways of talking about, say, you know, farm produce of, all right, I want the organic tomatoes. And you really should appreciate, you know, the best tomato or the most, um, you know, uh, high quality olive oil or something like that versus something say where it is the kind of rainbow confetti cake that is 18 colors and 25 different flavors. I mean, they're, they're a very different perspective towards food of, is it the simple, is it the kind of stripped down minimalist perspective that that's where the healthiest food is, that's where um, you can get the most nutrition and that's really the, the best way to eat is, is the simplest form and the more minimal form and appreciating these constituent ingredients. Mm. Or is it all about how complicated can we make these dishes? How many different components, different ingredients, how much can we show off in terms of opulence through a single dish where we, it's gonna be an 18 tier cake or it's gonna be a 25 different kind of meat turducken, something like that. Um, and so that's very, very broadly, I think some, a way to maybe understand this change from the Republic where it's simple, minimal, to the imperial style of food trends where it is show off as much as you can throw a thousand you know, pigs on your table, throw a thousand different flamingos, and you want to impress your guests through the complexity of your dishes. And so that, that is a very broad, stroke, very broad strokes way of understanding these different eating habits, but it is something that we do see represented philosophically as well, is that there's a change in the writings and perspective and general tone of philosophy from the Republic 
to Imperial Rome? That's a, a very short answer to a very big right. and a, a great question, actually. Uh, it's just, but it's just fascinating to think yeah. about in so many ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even if you think of the, the comparison people draw between the way Italians in Italy make their meatballs, which tend to be very small, and then the meatballs that their their relative, their Italian American relatives who came to America and took on the largesse of the American <laughs> Empire make, which are ginormous, ginormous things that are the size meatballs of your head. Of your head. Yeah. Yes. So still, these questions of philosophy as it relates to food and and opulence and empire, all these questions are still with us, and um, they'll they'll I think linger on in our upcoming lectures. Uh, so that's all the time we have for today. But we're we are zooming ahead now. Uh, in lecture three to the Aztec Empire. Um, folks, you're in for a treat. You're going to get to see Laura make avocado before, <laughs> make guacamole before your eyes in lecture three. So lots of goodies coming your way uh, in lecture three, which will be posted on Monday. Uh, in the meantime, Laura, it is as always a delight to, uh, to exchange ideas and uh, uh, eating suggestions with you. <laughs> Have a wonderful weekend. Yes, thank you so much. It was great, as always. All right, folks. Thank you so much for tuning.